Last Sunday night in this room, we got to hear from 11 or 12 of Chestnut Grove's creatives, um, artists, people who engage in the creative processes of various kinds. So we heard from a woodworker. We heard from uh, a painter, a couple of musicians, and we heard from a poet. And in encountering each of those people, and there were several others as well, we got a glimpse, not into just the product that they produce, but the process or the practice that they engage with. And it gave us a really vulnerable, kind of an intimate look into these people that we've known for years. Many of them have been here a long time. But we got to see them in a new kind of way that was stunning. One of those people was Adrienne Chan, who is a poet. And so part of the way she works her spiritual journey is through writing poetry. And she shared several of these poems last Sunday night. And it was just beautiful. So I thought today, maybe we could start this Sunday morning by reading some poetry together. I am not a poetry reader, generally. I'm definitely not a poetry writer. But I discovered this poem this week, and I think some of you may know it. So I'd like us to begin our time by reading together this poem by Joyce Kilmer called Trees. Ready? I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree. A tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast. A tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray. A tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair. Upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Only God can make a tree. How many of you are familiar with this poem? Somewhere I have a vague recollection, but this week it came alive. Especially the phrase, only God can make a tree. Poet Kilmer had eyes to see transcendent things about a tree. That's my first line of poetry in quite a long time, yeah? <laughs> Joyce Kilmer could see things about a tree that maybe not everyone has eyes to see. For instance, Kilmer could see that a tree's posture is one which is continuously upward facing in a posture of receiving the essentials from above that lead to aliveness. And the tree just is in that posture, lifting her hands in prayer. A tree lives in interdependence in all seasons. Whether it's rain or it's snow or the springtime robins, a tree knows how to live interdependently all the time. And a tree, a tree is most grounded in places that are invisible. They're rooted down where the nourishment that leads to all growth comes from. A tree naturally exists in that place. Only God can make a tree, Kilmer says. But I learned this week that Joyce Kilmer knew only a splinter of what we now know about trees a hundred years later. For instance, I learned this week that trees live in communities. That they are connected in ways that we didn't dream of really. That they talk, or not talk probably, but that they communicate with each other. That trees can hear and trees can smell. And trees work in mutual cooperation together in order to actively support the other trees in the forest. Now, these are the things that were considered fantasy just a while back in 
C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien wrote about trees in a way that was fantasy and now we're learning is way more accurate than we ever thought. Any Tolkien fans? In his 2015 book, um, The Hidden Life of Trees, Peter Wolben, he writes about his decades of research in the forest and what he's discovered about trees that we haven't known much before. And in his book, I just read about the first third of it this week, and the titles of his chapters are telling. Chapter one is called Friendships, followed by The Language of Trees. Chapter three, Social Security. Chapter four, Love. There's a chapter called Etiquette, and another chapter called uh, Aging Gracefully. Susan Samard is a ecologist and she details the structures of how these trees are connected. There's a vast network of fibers which actually bind the roots of one tree to the roots of another tree and these are called mycorrhizae. I think it would be better if it was mycorrhizae but I looked it up and I don't know why it's pronounced that way. Mycorrhizae. How many of you know about mycorrhizae? A few of you do. Yeah. <laughs> These are fungal fibers which serve to transport things like water and energy and biochemical and electrical signals from one tree to another tree in the forest. It truly is a wood wide web. Every forest has this functionality about it. Isn't that stunning? So if we had eyes to see, we would see that um, trees actually don't exist in, solit in solitary in their optimal state. They exist in interconnected webs. In fact, if you transplant trees and make things like orchards and groves and artificially constructed, they don't do this naturally in the same kind of way as a tree in the forest which grows up organically. There is a, an active network of communication happening in the forest. Now, Samar tells us that um, early on, trees will communicate and build these networks with trees of the same species. But as they mature, they actually extend out and start connecting to sp other species. A sign of maturity, whether we're talking about trees or people, I think. We start connecting in ways that we just wouldn't have imagined. Um, trees can send um, signals that help other trees learn when they need to start mounting a defense against a predator that is in the area. So a couple of examples. If a bug infested tree uh, is starting to have duress, it will send signals to the other trees that are vulnerable to the same pests through these networks. But even better, the acacia trees in Africa that are eaten by giraffes, when a giraffe begins to munch on the leaves of an acacia tree, it within minutes releases a scent that is picked up by acacia trees nearby in the area, downwind, and th those acacia trees will begin to mount a defense by putting into their leaves a chemical that is not tasty to giraffes. Furthermore, this is stunning, if a tree has a particular predator munching away on it, it emits an aroma or a scent at some points that actually is attractive to the predators of its predator. So birds would be attracted to this tree when it's being infested by a particularly tasty bug and trees are doing all of this and we had no idea maybe until just recently. Only God could make a tree. About 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul may have flashed with an inspired genius when he said to the church of Colossae, be like trees. Open your Bibles, if you would, back to Colossians chapter 2. We're going to take a second look at this letter that Paul wrote to this congregation. Be like trees, he says, at least I think so. Last week we took a look at Paul and we saw that when he was writing to the Colossians, the first thing he did was he gushed over how they were living their lives. 
Paul was so excited because what he had heard about them is that they were living their lives every day in community and they were living just like Jesus lived every day in community with other people. So the Colossians, they trusted God just like Jesus trusted God. The Colossians, they were loving people everywhere just like Jesus loved people everywhere. And the Colossians, they were bearing fruit with their lives in all places, in all times, just like Jesus bore fruit in all places at all times. Paul was stoked about the Colossians and he gushes about how thankful he is for their well-being. He is really, really excited about them. Now, Paul had never met a Colossian. So he's excited about this community that he's been told about by Epiphras and he says, not only am I excited for you, but I'm praying for you. So last Sunday, we tried to practice some of what Paul said he was doing for these people he'd never met. These acquaintances or these friends of a friend to whom he was writing. He said, I'm praying for you. And we spent a little time talking about the difference between when we think about somebody, which is what some people do. I joked at the Presbyterians. If you go to the hospital, the Presbyterian is going to say, I'll think about you while you're having surgery. Whereas Paul and all other Baptists said, <laughs> said not I'll think about you, but I'll pray for you. And we talked about this subtle difference between just thinking about somebody and praying for somebody. And the way I characterize it is when we pray for somebody, we are actually creating a sacred space between us where we're asking the presence of God to come in and be present among us. We're asking God's presence maybe to do something, but God is not a genie in a bottle that we summon in order to do our bidding. But the practice of prayer is creating a space between us. And I was reminded of Jesus when he said, whenever two or more of you are gathered, well, I'm there among you, right? In a new kind of way. So we practiced that last week in community. Now, the, when I said we're going to do this, I watched some of you get really tense because I said we're going to pray for each other. Just a one-sentence prayer. So would you, like Paul, would you share with the person next to you one place in your life where you would like to have some divine guidance? How many of you were here last Sunday? And you can attest that, yeah, the first time, like the temperature went up in the room because everybody was asked to pray for the person beside them. But then I asked to pray the second way Paul prayed and everybody kind of relaxed a bit and the sound in the room was beautiful. Listening to you pray for each other. Just one sentence prayers. And then by the time we prayed the third round, praying for some strength in weak places or the capacity to get at joy again, I was watching a little bit. I was trying not to eavesdrop. But I was watching and several of you were crying. Tears streaming down your face. Because when we pray for one another, there's a vulnerability involved. We're asking the God of the universe to step in among us. Last week, we practiced what Paul said he was practicing for the Colossians. Even though he didn't know them, he was engaged in this intimate practice of praying for them. So we started talking about Paul's gushing over the Colossians for how they were living. And then we practiced what Paul practiced around the Colossians or for the Colossians. Today, I want us to turn to what Paul is maybe best known for. And that's where Paul is going to start telling them now how they should live. That is a word of exhortation. So in today's text, Paul is already gushed, he's already prayed, and now he's saying, I want you to live like this. Be like trees. So verse 6, let's read this together. Live your lives in Christ, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith. Be like trees. Be rooted a certain way, a certain place. Friends, there's no more life critical and influential variable in your whole lives than where one chooses to be planted or rooted. This is true both of trees and of people. Where do you choose to be planted or rooted? Many of you know the book of Psalms. And Psalm 1 opens su suggesting that there are basically two plots in which a person or a tree might get planted. One is among cynics and scoffers, sinners. But the other is in the spirit or the law of the Lord, as the Psalter says. And the Psalter says about the people who are planted in plot B, their lives are healthy and vibrant. And let's read the way the Psalter describes it. He says, 
They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all they do, they prosper. But not so for those who choose to be planted among cynics, scoffers, sinners. Those the Psalter portrays as wind-blown, like dry chaff. So my question for us individually and even collectively is, where are you choosing to be planted? Where are you choosing to take nourishment every day for your mind? Where are you choosing, what elements are you sucking up that are determining how you function and what you prioritize every day? Are you dialed in to the cynics and the skeptics and the sinners? Or are you planted, rooted in the Spirit of God, in the law of the Lord? Because the two plots yield radically different products or trees. So the Psalter here and the Apostle Paul to the Colossians, he says, be rooted, be rooted and built up in Christ. The last few years I've been um, deeply burdened. Uh, let me tell you why. And it's related to what Paul says here about being rooted. He says, um, this may be the tap root about being well rooted. He says, um, when you're rooted, you need to be rooted in Christ. I think we've got that here. And this is the key, I think, to that. Where Paul says, here's the thing that you've got to notice. Um, let's read it, actually. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit. So there's this plot of empty deceit, cynics, I've been thinking. And then there's this plot of in Christ. And um, this term empty deceit really flashed up for me this week because it seems to me that we live in a time where the empty deceit is like hip level every day. And for the last five years or so, I've been really burdened by what seems to me to be this flood of empty deceit. I can mark a time as the first time I ever heard somebody use the term alternative facts. A term which got not only accepted, but kind of became mainstream in our conversation community. These alternative facts. Empty deceit. Alternative facts. And the reason that it was so frightening to me is because I know that an organized and a coordinated society cannot live in a land that accepts alternative facts. Let's just take the time that we started worship today. If one of you says, well, it's 1125, and the other one says, no, 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 it's 1152, and you say, no, it's 1106, we simply can't exist in a time where people are naming different facts, like alternative facts. It's terrifying to me to know that people are embracing alternative facts and that that wasn't just immediately rejected as anathema to community. But what's been also burdening and scary to me is the number of well-intended people who seem to be partaking regularly in alternative facts. Even people of faith are partaking of alternative facts in kind of a continual way. Paul says, do not be taken captive by empty deceit. Don't, don't go there. So a person of faith is told by Jesus, if anybody wants to follow after me, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me every day, right? What I've been watching some people do is instead of emptying themselves, they bolster themselves by taking up a new conspiracy every day and they're living that way. And I'm really burdened by this and this guidance or exhortation from Paul is don't be taken captive by empty deceit. Don't be taken captive by the place where there's no truth. This is like the tap root of being in, rooted in Christ is not being led astray by all kinds of other things. Um, now, this deceit or this attempt to deceive is not a new thing, 
right? <laughs> this didn't just happen five years ago. Deception makes its first appearance in the garden, right? But likewise, that same status-seeking appetite that led humanity to partake of the falsehoods is exactly the same status-seeking appetite that we may have, and it leads to exactly the same kind of consequences, damages, that it created in the garden. That is, it creates separation from people and God, and it creates dissonance between people. You know how Adam and Eve got sideways after partaking of the falsehood? So when I watch people today actively partaking of empty deceit or falsehoods or alternative facts, I get really concerned because I'm watching the same thing happen today that was happening from the beginning. Friends, Paul says, do not be taken captive by empty deceits or falsehoods. So he goes on um, in uh, talking about um, the why. But let me tell you a little story. How many of you can identify places where like empty deceit is fueling fires among people? Can you think of places? I mean, it seems everywhere. I had a really uh, social media f savvy friend tell me uh, just recently, you know, I took two social media platforms off my phone in the last 10 days, TikTok and uh, Twitter, I think. And the initial thing I'm noticing is, for one, I engaged in 44% less screen time within 10 days. But more importantly, I experienced a massive decline in internal aggression. That is humongous. Where are you planted? Where are you taking your nourishment from? Paul says, don't be captive to empty deceit. It will kill you. <laughs> it will kill you. So then he goes on. To say this other thing that um, I want us to pay attention to, and that is kind of the why. Why be rooted in Christ and not just in Twitter land or wherever your social media preferences are? And Paul offers this. Two big reasons, I think. Number one comes in verse 9 and 10. Let's read this together. In Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him. If you know the author of the Hebrews, he says that, Christ, that Jesus is the exact imprint and the perfect reflection of God. And Paul believed that, just like that. That if you wanted to know what God is like, you just look at Jesus. What does God care about? Well, let's look at Jesus. How did God function? What, did God pri what does God prioritize? What does God resist? Just look at Jesus. It is a perfect illustration. Paul said the fullness of God is present in Jesus. But then he goes on to say not only that, but the fullness of humanity is also in Jesus. What can my life look like? Well, just look at Jesus. It can look like that. What should I and we, what should we prioritize and elevate and pursue and protect? Well, just look at Jesus. I know that sounds a little simple, like a Sunday school answer. Well, what's the answer? Well, it's Jesus. But Paul seems to think that in Jesus, both the fullness of God and the apex of humanity coexist in one place. That the fullness of deity and the fullness of humanity dwell there. So if you have questions, it's not complicated. How should I live my life? Well, just look at Jesus and do it like he did it and things will be good. You'll encounter the fullness of God in the presence of Christ. Now, in May, we did this little study. Some of you remember the Alan Hirsch and Michael Frost book, Read Jesus. And we asked, what does it look like to read Jesus our church? What does it look like to read Jesus my life? And we came up, well, I came up with a list of 15 core truths about Jesus. They were very simple. But if we're confused, it's really easy just to look at Jesus and see how did Jesus live. And so things like this. Well, Jesus mediates the grace and mercy of God to others. And so we ask ourselves, am I mediating the grace and mercy of God to other people. It's not, it's not complex, right? So if you need one of these handouts, they're back there on the table if you need a little guidance. But if you want the bigger story, you just look here. There are four whole books about the life of Jesus and how he lived and how he showed us who God is and how he showed us who we can be. Paul says, yeah, why? Why tap? Why is... Why is it critical to be rooted in Christ? Well, because that's where the fullness of God is. And that's where your fullness can be, is in Christ. Right? 
The second big reason that uh, he says that you need to be rooted in Christ, and that is this, it's very simple. Well, because you were dead, and now you've been made alive. How many of us need to be made a little more alive than we are? Yeah, yeah. Will I be rooted in Christ? Because that's the place where the old that needs to give way gives way, and the new that's full of potential can come. It's in Christ. Sounds kind of mysterious, doesn't it? Mystical, in Christ. What does that mean? Well, like much of this whole section, um, Paul's language here is about as orderly as a root ball. Like it's twisty this way, and then there's a phrase over here, and then there's some language up this way. And so you look at it, and you're kind of going, what does this mean? Well, here Paul gives kind of a series of images of what it means to be made alive in Christ. You were dead, but with Christ you've been made alive. That's why you should stay rooted to him. So some of those images, you'll be familiar with them. He says this, next slide. He goes, well, you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision. Now, friends, I suspect that that resonated a lot more with the first century folks than it does with us today. I suspect some of us have been circumcised, but what circumcision meant to the first century audience, it had to do with a, uh, we'll say, a, a sensitive but substantial shift toward God. Circumcision was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant, right? Abraham's the first one that when God said, hey, I want you to go and through you I'm going to bless all of humanity. And all of those who said, yeah, we're in, they said, well, I'm going to be circumcised. <laughs> that was the sign that said, I'm in on the Abrahamic covenant. I want to be a part of that. So for the first century audience, when they hear circumcision, they're thinking, oh, that was the massive and somewhat uncomfortable undertaking that we all did in order to demonstrate that we want to be a part of blessing all of humanity. This Abraham. What Paul says is that in Christ, you were circumcised in a different way. Your heart has been circumcised. That means this sensitive but significant shift towards God happens in here. Now, how many of us um, have undertaken to circumcise ourselves? No, not me. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, of course not. Circumcision is something that gets done to you. And what Paul said is that you got circumcised in Christ. With Christ, he does this subtle, substantial, but also sensitive shift inside of you, in your heart. It's a heart shift. Now, I don't know about you, but I know some days I need to be heart refreshed again. I need my heart to shift, you know? Paul says that's one of the ways we can talk about what being made alive looks like, is this picture, this image of circumcision. But he goes on with another couple little curly cue roots. He says another image is this. You were buried with him in baptism, and you were raised to walk, I say, in a new kind of life, where you were raised with him from death. How many of you know the Exodus story? Exodus, second book of the Bible, short form is this. God's people were stuck in sadness and limitation and slavery and shackled in hopelessness and no future except servitude to the empire. And God says, oh, no, 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 that's not the purpose of my people. I'm going to set them free from that, and I'm going to set them free into the promised land. Well, they go through what? The Red Sea. They go down into the sea, buried, and then they're raised into the promised land. That image of being buried and then being raised also shows up at crucifixion. Jesus was buried, right? And he was raised again. Paul says, yeah, it's just like that with you, Colossians or church. In Christ, that old has been buried or killed and the new gets to be, you're moving from a place of sadness, shackles and stuckness into a place of new possibility and new aliveness and new hope and new freedom. It's just another image to try to tell the Colossians what it means to be in Christ. There's a new kind of aliveness at hand. God gives us that. There's one third image, and this is the last one that I'll, the last little root that I'm going to try to tangle out from the root ball. And that is that he forgave all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us. How many of us carry around at least some small amount of guilt or shame for our past? Yeah. Okay, finally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course, it's a universal experience. And what Paul is telling folks, if, if circumcision doesn't resonate and being buried and raised anew doesn't resonate, well, how about this? You've been forgiven. That in what Christ did, he took all that guilt and shame and he solved it, nailed it to a tree, Paul says. 
you don't have to hold it anymore. I want you to be free, to be lightened, to be burdened, I mean to unburdened, to be set free to a new kind of aliveness that is akin to being forgiven. There's no need for you to carry that around. Do you know, in Jesus' day, anybody in that time frame, orthodox religion in their mind was a purely behavior-based endeavor. Their conception of God was one who had a strict rule sheet and couldn't wait to pounce on you for the things that you did wrong. Ah, you missed number seven. Now the gig was that God was superior and unbeatable and humans were kind of sentenced to futility and failure. You can't keep all the rules all the time. So you're destined to failure and you just piled up this guilt. Now you could kill some pigeons and get some of it set free. But what Paul says about Christ is, no, 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 no. See, I have good news for you. God isn't eager to punish you or keep score against you. God wants to set you free. What Jesus said verbatim was, it's the thief that comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you might have what? Life in abundance. The first century religious folks could not fathom a God who was on their side who was eager for them to be more alive, more free. And so when Paul uses this language, he's saying, I know you think that the rules and the guilt are the thing, but what I'm telling you is in Christ, all of that has been taken care of. It's done. Jesus said, it is finished. Let it go. Paul is hopeful that the Colossians and maybe we today can be alive in Christ. And so he gives us those images. You're, you've been circumcised. You've been raised to a new kind of life. Or you've been forgiven. All of that guilt of the law. Done. How many of us could use a little more aliveness that sort of way? The good news of the gospel is that God came in Christ to set us free. To give us open spaces. To facilitate that sensitive but substantial shift in our heart toward God. And all of these images, Paul's writing to this church that he loves in Colossae, even though he has never met them. So here's the good news. Finish this. In Christ, you and I, we get to be heart shifted. We get to be buried and raised. We, we get to be forgiven and set free. Paul wanted the Colossians to hear that. And I think he, likewise, God would want us to hear that even now. Now, I'm going to just let you know, the tempter will give you some alternative facts about that. The tempter will say something like this. Um, you know, you got to get your act together and then God will love you. That is empty deceit. Or it may be like this. Uh, you don't really need all of that. You're fine just like you are. Uh, empty deceit. Alternative facts. Or um, I don't really need God. I can do it on my own. Uh, alternative facts. Empty deceit. The tempter will keep telling us those things, but what Paul says is that in Christ, there's a new kind of aliveness at hand. And I pray that we might uh, taste this. Our vitality, church, depends on us being like trees. Simone, Samar, Simone, uh, whatever her name is, she says, the saplings connected to the network do well while those that are disconnected fail to thrive. I know too many people these days who are disconnecting themselves from the forest, from the community of faith. You can't make it on your own. You're not designed to. Trees planted away from forests do not do well like trees planted in the forest. So I echo, in closing, Paul's exhortation about how to live be like trees. He says it this way. Hold fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God. I pray that would be true for us. I pray that we might be like a forest. That each one of us, an interdependent, nourished and contributing part of that, would remember what Joyce Kilmer said, only God can make a tree. Let's pray. (laughs) 
Oh God, we try to go it alone. Rugged, tough. But I'm reminded there, there are not many more majestic images of strength than the sequoia trees. And I'm mindful that today there are fires raging just nearby. I thank you, God, that those trees, they've been through the fires. And the network and connections and the way of being that they have in this world has led them to be the most mighty images of life that I can think of. I pray we might be like that. We might be well-rooted, intimately connected, lifting our hands to receive what you would give continuously, day and night. Thanks for trees. Thanks for us. Thanks for loving us in all the ways you do. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen.